there's so many people who don't know anything about Middle Eastern art. They just have these sort of you know, unfortunate views on the region that it's just apocalyptic and just in political chaos. And to a certain extent, it might be. But that there's a rich tradition of art and craftsmanship here that doesn't go away with conflict. So the idea is to always you know, promote this and that there is a vibrant art scene. I'm not here to talk about the politics, but the reality is there's much more to Iran. It's a very richly layered country that has thousands of years of history. And no matter what happens politically, um, you know, you can't suppress the cultural roots of the country. And so someone needs to show that. And then when people see, oh my God, that's, that, that's kind of cool artwork. Iranians make that? I thought Iranians only make bombs. Like, it, it will be a different perception. You know, culture bridges a lot of misunderstanding and also shows that there's commonality. This is Nikki Najumi, very political artist, Iranian, based in New York. This poor guy, he was like a revolutionary in the Shah's regime, sort of a communist. Yes, yeah, like okay, okay. And then when the revolution happened, he had high hopes that yeah, his, all the, all the his affiliations would be, and then the again, he got, he got tormented there as well. So he never got to like, do his work properly mm -hmm. in Iran. I started by collecting things I like, and the works that I've chosen over time, I believe are, are trying to create an archive of Iranian artwork that spans from, let's say, the 60s until today. As any art collector will tell you, you never stop collecting. Certainly, it's becoming more and more rounded. The jigsaw is almost complete. Mm -hmm. We built these sort of niches here. We created this design here so that you can just sort of pick up a book and just lounge mm -hmm. around. And in all the rooms, as you know, they all open to the balcony, so mm. you have this natural light coming in. It's it, positioned on both sides, you don't get a direct sound. I was worried that, like, basically, you know, that the artwork would be exposed. Mm. It yeah. never is. Not no, in direct sound. Yeah, yeah, it isn't, you're right. Mm. But that's the, the architect positioned the building that way. Yeah. I was in Iran, and a friend of mine said, why don't we go see some galleries? And we went, and I found some paintings I really liked. And they were very affordable, and that's how it started. That was back in 2004 or five. He's the number one emerging artist in the world. And I was lucky to get this because he does about five or six of these works a year. Okay. And the last batch went to major, major collections. collections yeah. The reality is I think if something is aesthetically pleasant to look at, it's always going to be somewhat commercial. And then, of course, you know, you get a sense based on which galleries and which collectors are, are piling into an artist that also sort of, not always, but does set a, a very definitive trend of where that artist might be going. So you look at those sort of tea leaves to see if an artist is going to be commercial. But I would say it's a combination of how does it look plus... Who's, who's involved in the development of that artist's career? The hard part was curating yes. from what you have. Yes, what so goes away. So yeah. it blends. Because otherwise, you know, the risk is you make it almost too much. Yes. Okay. And so why I do that, very mindful not to, I mean, there's a lot of artwork, but it's not overpopulated. Yes. In tandem to when I started buying some of these works, many of the auction houses started setting up regional offices. Christie's being the leader, then Sotheby's, then Bonham's. And then these auctions on started bringing awareness to the whole artistic scene. And then the prices just started going meteorically up. Like any market that sort of increases tenfold in like a year or two, the effect was very positive because suddenly these artists that were barely able to like sell their works for any price were achieving good numbers. It gave a lot of aspiration and hope to other artists that were you know, just on the fringe of coming in together as artists. So suddenly everyone wanted to be that artist that achieved the high price. And, you know, it makes people work hard. It makes people want to make great work because they think maybe there's a chance I can sell it for like a great price. And whilst that might sound materialistic, the reality is that's been the case through the ages throughout all, you know, booming art times. For works to have any sort of longevity and survive the test of time, they need to be in these sort of A-rated global institutions. It's all very well to have a great collection on your own, but you know, as you know, it's very difficult for art to survive beyond a generation or two. 
because you just can't control what will happen in the future. But you have more certainty when institutions have, uh, like the British Museum, like the Tate, like the Met, like the Guggenheim, have their own permanent collections. So hopefully the result is that you know, more and more collectors will look at you know, Middle East art as global art and just collect it like they collect anything. And that's what's happening slowly because you, know, you look at seven years ago, there were no Middle Eastern artists represented by Western galleries. Today there are, you know, there are dozens of them. And then I bought these like fake plants. Fucking so expensive. Like, really big it's like a 30,000 dirham olive tree. Hello. Okay, take it 5,000 and pay and don't talk about it. Take it, take it, finished. Thank you.